Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for what promises to be an emotional and timely event. My name is Karen Levin. I am the executive director of the Baltimore Zionist District, and it's an honor to have you all with us. This morning, we're privileged to collaborate with Maccabi World Union Women Speak Up Division, to bring three stories of heroic bravery and survival. Our speakers will share personal accounts of the October 7th massacre, experiences of being held captive by Hamas, the ongoing plight of loved ones still being held in captivity. Additionally, we'll discuss actionable ways for you to help from here in the United States by spreading awareness with your communities. Please note that unlike most BZD Zoom events, panelists will not be taking questions during this session due to the sensitive nature of the topic. However, we will open the chat at the end of the program so that you can share your words of encouragement and support with our speakers. Please help me warmly welcome our first speaker, Shirit Sachs Chaim, the Honorary Secretary of the Maccabi World Union and Chair of the Education Department of the Maccabi 2025. Since October, since October 7th, Shirit has been deeply involved in various aspects of the war. For the past two months, she has led the Women's Forum of the Maccabi World Union Movement, raising awareness about sexual terrorism that had occurred and continues to occur since that day, Saturday, October 7th. Shalom and thank you, Karen, and thank you, BZD, for organizing this important event. I'm here with you representing Maccabi World Union and its Women's Forum. In a few words for those who are not familiar with Maccabi World Union, uh, so I can tell you that Maccabi World Union is the world's largest Jewish sports and education organization with the six confederation, 450,000 people in over 70 countries. And we have years of great partnership with BZD. Since October 7, the movement was involved and took action in different aspects of the war. We hosted more than 1,000 evacuees from the south and the north in our hotel in Farmakabia. We had an international awareness campaign with Israeli and international athletes calling to release the hostages in Gaza. And now we are in the middle of the campaign led by the Women's Forum of the Movement. We understood what the, the, we understood that we are facing moment in the Israeli history that the movement and its member due to their deployment in the world have the power to be significant in resonating and ca uh, carrying out action that it influence global public opinion, which will assist in bringing about the recognition, condemnation, and preventing of denial that sexual terrorism occur and continue to occur in Gaza since October 7. By doing so, it will contribute to the persecution of terrorists in the future for war crimes and crime against humanity and ensure that the immediate release of the hostages, children, women, and men. Personally, I must say that I appreciate your willingness to participate in this kind of uh, Zoom meeting, despite the fact that you will be exposed to difficult testimonies. For me, who deal with this issue intensively, I find that each new exposure to testimony shakes anew, but at the same time, it strengthens the decision I and my colleagues in the movement have made to take the lead in raising awareness and speak up for those who can't. I'm honored to invite the first speaker, Inspector General Mirit Ben Mayor, uh, Chief Superintendent Mirit Ben Mayor, served as the head of communication in Israel Police. Mirit worked as a criminal prosecutor for the state for 15 years, and she holds master's degree in international and public law from the Northern University, Chicago, and Tel Aviv University. Mirit, to that, thank you.
Okay. So, uh, good morning to all of you. Um, and thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to uh, tell you and to share with you uh, what uh, has been going on here in Israel since the 7th uh, of October, since that Black Sabbath. Um, and also to uh, share with you um, what we as the Israel police who's leading the national investigation regarding this, these atrocities that took place have been doing since uh, the 7th of October and what we see very clearly uh, through the investigation up until now. Um, so uh, as I was uh, int introduced, I'm uh, Mirit ben Mayor. I'm an advocate. I, uh, I'm a former prosecutor um, dealing with uh, many, many cases of uh, criminal uh, criminal law for uh, over 15 years. And so um, the knowledge of uh, collecting uh, evidence and uh, translating them into um, indictments is uh, very, very close to me. And um, I'll tell you that this investigation that we're leading here is uh, nothing like we have ever seen, nothing like we've ever dealt with, uh, and especially regarding the sexual uh, violence, uh, which was uh, used, and I'm stating here, which was used as uh, the war weapon in this uh, terrible terror attack, which met us here on the 7th of October. Uh, I'll go back a little bit uh, to that uh, Black uh, Saturday, and I'll tell you that um, the Israel police uh, was, um, I think, the first to actually understand what is, uh, what is going on here. Because um, in that morning, uh, all of us here in Israel, it was a Saturday, it was a uh, Simchat Torah holiday, very happy holiday. Um, all of a the sudden there was a missile attack, but not something that we're used to, because we are used to missile attacks here in Israel. Uh, but this was something else, it was something very, very um, long. And uh, it uh, the missiles just didn't stop coming not only to the southern uh, area of Israel, but also to the area of Tel Aviv, which is in the central uh, part of Israel. I'm sure most of you have uh, known and, and hopefully been here. Also to Jerusalem. Uh, it was a massive attack. And uh, the Israel uh, police officers who serve in that area uh, quickly understood that something uh, different was uh, happening that morning and that um, uh, actions must be taken very quickly. And therefore, all the ones who were on job that uh, morning, but also the ones who were not uh, working, but who lived in that area, just uh, took whatever um, artillery they had with them and came out of their houses and literally fought with these uh, thousands of uh, terrorists who just came into Israel simultaneously into 20 different sites and um, attacked us like, um, uh, as I said, simultaneously in that party that took place, in that music festival that took place in which thousands of youngsters were having a great uh, 48 uh, hours of uh, music. And also, um, so they came there, they came to the kibbutzim, they came to uh, different cities down south, uh, very quiet cities. And this whole area was uh, very quickly a war zone, literally a war zone. Um, and um, therefore, the Israeli uh, police of the southern area, uh, the chief of that po of the police of the southern area, so southern district, um, uh, uh, quickly called and 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 declared that we're in a war and uh the actions were taken uh accordingly 
We lost 58 of our friends that morning who fought and who rescued uh, many uh, civilians um, and also uh, managed to stop the terrorists from continuing up to northern uh, areas in Israel. That was their plan. And we know that uh, according to the investigation and according to the uh, evidence that we see. Um, I would I would like to uh, just uh, elaborate a little bit uh, about what we did that day, as we understood that there were thousands of people that are missing or that their families had no idea what is going on with them. We uh, opened up when, uh, a family center uh, to where families could go and uh, give testimonies regarding their loved ones that are missing. And also, we um, opened up an identification center uh, in order for the bodies, which we first thought there were about 100, 200, 500, and eventually we uh, know now that over 1,200 people were murdered in this massacre. So um, I'm jumping uh, into the investigation itself, and I can tell you that um, what we see is that there are clear evidence that uh, this was um, that the crimes that were taken against us were that were held against us were crimes against humanity, and according to the international law, um, in order for me to declare something like this, I, can, I, I need to know that uh, there was a plan, that there was a continuous action simultaneously in different places, and these are the facts. Um, we saw and we see according to the evidence from uh, what we found on the terrorist bodies in the different places, um, in their bags, through their videos, etc. cetera, uh, they were coming in with clear directions to murder as many, to burn as many houses and people, to be as brutal as possible, to kidnap as many, and to rape as many, and especially to humiliate. So how do we know that it was not maybe just, you know, 10, 20 crazy terrorists who decided to rape and then murder? We know that because as I said, we saw the different scenes, the different 20 scenes. Not only us, the police officers saw, but also survivors, first responders, eyewitnesses, and other witnesses who saw naked bodies, who saw men and women whose genitals were cut, whose genitals were shot, we saw women with their lower uh, part of the, their clothes ripped, the, uh, the area of the underwear, if there was underwear left, was bleeding. We saw the bodies in the identification center that I told you about, bodies that came in cut some of the people were some of the bodies were without breasts the breasts were cut some of the men their genitals were cut um we have eyewitnesses who tell us what they saw for example one eyewitness at the party, at the festival, who told us that she was 
pretending to be dead. She was hiding under a tree, pretending to be dead, and she saw with her own eyes terrorists taking a woman, a young woman, naked woman. One of them raped her and then threw her to another one. The other one cut her breast off, one of her breasts off. Then he raped her. And while he was raping her, he shot her in the head and murdered her. Only then he left her while she's dead, obviously. And actually most of the victims, the rape victims are not with us. They were murdered. They cannot tell us their voice cannot be heard. And unfortunately, many of the survivors find it very, very difficult to come and talk. And so slowly we do see them coming. We're waiting for them. We're giving them um, the help and the circumstances that will, will enable them to come and tell us what they saw with their own eyes. We have special investigators dealing with the sexual atrocities. And when I say sexual atrocities, it's not only rape, as I said, and this must be clear because also what we hear from hostages who come back, who came back, sexual atrocities and sexual violence is still going on these days to the poor hostages that are still there. Humiliation is a factor well known in this type of war. We saw it in different countries. We saw it in uh, the different countries in, in, in Europe, in Africa, and now we see it here. I must tell you, I want to give you uh, just a little glimpse from uh, the evidence in, that I brought with me. I cannot show you the videos or uh, the investigations themselves, but I can read you um, some quotes. First of all, one of the terrorists, which by the way, they're all investigated and none of them say any word of regret. You know, as a criminal prosecutor, I have read and saw a lot of uh, criminals in different types of criminal uh, activities. And uh, some of them even uh, were indicted for sexual atrocities. But many of them find their way to either regret or be embarrassed or ashamed of what they did. Here, we do not see that. What we see are terrorists that are telling us that they were trained for this. They were tra trained, they all, each and every one had their uh, job in this huge um, attack. It was a very planned one. It was a methodical one, a methodical attack with clear instructions. And I can quote one of the um, terrorists who told us that they were sent to dirty them. When we asked him, what do you mean dirty them? Then he said rape, not regretting, but he said it. A police officer who was one of the first responders testified, I couldn't drive because there was a baby cradle full of blood on the road. 
a baby that was outside his cradle and the naked woman lying next to the baby body. She was naked, badly injured. Bullets were in her body. Can you imagine that? A rescuer that arrived to a house on a kibbutz testified. Inside the shower, there was a body of a cuffed woman. She was without any underwear. The body was in the corner and her hands were tied. <clears throat> Another testimony from the party, from the music festival, a survivor tells us, women without clothes, some without the upper body clothes, some without the lower body clothes, blood over their lower body, butchered people. We found a woman's body dumped outside without pants, without underpants, burnt, barely any hair left on her. This is just a glimpse. But, you know, we collected thousands of testimonies already and we're still not done. We watched over 200,000 videos of the terrorists. You saw some of them uh, while they were filming themselves and putting up their films up to the net. They were so proud of what they're doing. We watched 200, 000, over 200,000 visuals. We speak to families. We speak to survivors. And we actually understand that this was just like another Holocaust. I would like to just, before I end and before uh, you can ask uh, questions, maybe you're asking yourselves, um, how come it took time to the world to talk to, to talk about the sexual atrocities. Why did we have to go to the UN and to speak up there in order to convince the world that this actually happened? Why did women organizations shut their mouths? Some of them still haven't spoken. Why do I, myself, and others have to go and talk to parliaments? I spoke in the German, in the French, in the British parliaments to tell the world what happened. Why do we have to prove that? Why weren't we believed? So we believe that even the world could not understand and bear the fact that such atrocities could actually happen. This is what we think and Unfortunately, it's not working for the world because the UN uh, representative, Pramila Patton, who came here to Israel, said and wrote that according to what she saw and what she was exposed to and what she, uh, and the material that she saw, the evidence that we showed her, there were definitely sexual atrocities and sexual violence taken during this war as a war tool. And not only her, also many others believe and they do. And I, I must tell you that we see a lot of support from the different countries and we're 
asking you to help us with your support, but not only by listening to us, by going and spreading it more and more and more. Because if it happened to us here in Israel, it can happen anywhere. Think about the 134 hostages that are still held by the Hamas ISIS and do everything that you can in order to help us bring them back all as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Uh, Mina, thank you so much for your for your words and for being here today. I think it's such an imperative conversation that we have um, with so many people on the call. Um, what what actions can the Jewish communities around the world take? Do you have any specific actions to give people that we can take? Yes, I think that uh, we have to all be united and to tell any group, even a small group, a big group, uh, to tell the press, to tell the government, to tell even influence, influencers what, they, what you heard right now. Because what I'm talking about is not something that um, we're imagining. It happened. We saw it with our bare eyes. I still can smell the smell of death in the identification center where so many bodies came in, in trucks, butchered in, in a situation that it was so difficult to identify some of the people. And if I think, or if we think of what these people, and especially these women, went through in the last minutes of their life, it's something that humanity cannot bear. And therefore, to talk about it, to speak about it, to tell more and more and more, and to influence in order, not only, firstly, of course, to bring back the hostages as SOS quickly as possible. But not only that, we have to make sure that something like this will not possibly happen anywhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Thank you. And we will be recording this event. So as as Mirit said, um, would appreciate you sharing this, of course, with with people that you know. That's a great way to spread awareness and to share. Um, I would like to please welcome um, Karen Flash, a 35-year-old mother and resident of Kibbutz Kfaraza, who will be sharing her testimony with us. Karen holds a BA in English Literature and Linguistics and an MA in Linguistics and currently works as a Pilates instructor and English teacher. Karen, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing with our audience. Thank you for having me, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Of course, thank you. Not having a very good day today, so I apologize in advance for- It's okay, take your time. My mind not working. Um, um, so um, I've been one moment, sorry. Uh, 
Um, I was born in Kibbutz Niram, uh, which is very close to Kfaraza. It's five minutes. Um, and uh, my parents moved to Kfaraza in 2001. Um, I was 12, I think, seventh grade. And um, they've lived there ever since. Um, I've left, traveled, went to do my military service and, and study. And I've lived in Belsheva. I went there to study and then I stayed there and met my husband there and we started our family and we had our daughter. And um, we moved to Kfaraza in August, last August. And um, my parents were renovating their house um, during that time. Um, they actually moved to a building next to us in Belsheva in March. And they finished their renovation. They didn't really finish their renovation, actually. They decided they're done and wanted to move back to their house on September 27. And um, my mom was an American citizen. Um, she came to Israel to volunteer. And um, she came from a Christian family, a Protestant family. And um, she met my dad. She converted to Judaism. They got married. They had us, and that's that's the introduction in a nutshell. Um, I think I missed some of what Mirit said, but I think she described the the feeling of of that morning that something was wrong very quickly. This was, it felt like this is something that's off. Um. We all woke up at 6.30 in the morning, except a few younger um, younger members of the kibbutz that um, apparently slept until 9 or 10, and who knows how. Um, but the rockets woke us up, and we ran to our daughter's room to get her uh, to our bedroom, which was the safe room. And uh, my mom immediately texted me and asked me if we're okay, what's going on. Um, you said, it's very noisy. Uh, are we okay? I said, we're in the safe room. Um, what's happening? Um, do you have any idea what's happening? Because I'm usually out of touch with the news. And I'm. my husband was a journalist. I felt like that's okay for me not to pay attention. If there's something really important, he can keep me updated. Um, so I usually don't know when things happen, when there's an operation, when there's a military operation, if someone was um, um, killed, if there was, I don't know, something happened. I usually don't know it's how I find out um, when there is a massive rocket attack. And um, no one, no one found out why. Like There wasn't... Um, um, no higher up in the Hamas was um, eliminated uh, during the night and there was no um, secret operation and there wasn't anything that we know that might have caused this, um, which is what made a lot of people think that this is something very, very bad, um, very strange. It took us a few, it took us, I think, about 15 or 20 minutes to really understand what's happening. Um not without not that we still understand what's happening but at first there was a little um pause in the um, in the rockets and then my husband says okay so i'm going to go make coffee let's start the day very very early okay um he went out uh, went to the kitchen to get us um a cup of coffee and uh, i went uh, to get um i went to take my daughter um One second. I went to get uh, my daughter um, to her room to change her diaper, to get her bottle, to basically get her ready for the morning. And um, then we got a message that we need to go into the safe rooms and lock the doors. And um, so I took everything with me, took a bag of diapers, a bag, a bag of wipes, a big bo bottle of water and um, her bottles and her formula to make her food. Uh, grabbed her bag on the way and it had a change of clothes and toys and everything from the day before when we visited uh, my husband's parents in Belsheva. 
so she had everything she could possibly need in the room except oxygen um which was running low um but she was she was fine throughout the day she was she slept so well and she was so very cheerful and cute and it was very hard to handle that um when i'm terrified and we just started waiting and people started asking us what's happening and we said that we have no idea the windows closed the doors closed all we hear is bombing and then eventually um it turned into gunfire and there was just automatic weapons everywhere all over the place in front of us behind us behind our behind our house in the front lawn um on the roof it felt like there was everywhere we got a message from the kibbutz at 7 30 that there were terrorists um there's a how did they phrase it there was an infiltration incident um in the kibbutz so when you say something like that people assume it's one two terrorists ten at the most um there was a moment very similar to that in um 2014, I think it's Protective Edge um, military operation, that there were, I think, 10 terrorists that almost uh, managed to enter Niram. Uh, they were just outside of the um, of the fence. Um, there were like three paces away from the kibbutz fence, from the kibbutz uh, pool and my friend's house. And um, at that time, the military, there were casualties um, on our side. There were soldiers that were killed, but no civilians were killed. They didn't really manage to get into the kibbutz. And this hasn't happened again. So he said, OK, so if there is an infiltration uh, and terrorists enter the state of Israel, then the IDF can handle it. Um, and we're protected. There are military bases all over um all over the area, there's a huge military base in Achaloz right next to us. Um, there was one in Kfaraza, there's one next to Niram. So there's, and uh, the first response teams from the um, kibbutzim, uh, from the kibbutzes, um, that that's their reserve training and that's what they do. They're trying to respond uh, to hold off any threat for 20 or 30 minutes until the IDF joined them and um, protect the kibbutz because that's it's really all the kitat koninut that's all really they can do um but they were left on their own for hours and hours those who managed to um stay alive because um apparently in kfaraza they when we woke up they were already inside the kibbutz um they um used motorized parachutes to fly into the heart of the kibbutz where the armory was. Um, there was also a law that passed, um, I don't know when, a while ago, um, that all of the weapons, the first response team for every kibbutz has weapons and they have usually like the long M16 ones, the outdated kind of weapons, but most of them don't have any weapons at home. Some have um, guns, but very few. And um, they were uh, forced, that law forced them to put their weapons, not in their home, but in the armory, because in case of a break-in, um, the burglar can use this weapon to cause more damage or something of that sort was the excuse that was given. So basically, the first response team that were supposed to protect the kibbutz were ambushed on their way to get their weapons. They, the terrorists found a house near the armory or a roof near the armory and they set a sniper on it and he just shot every single person that went near that area. And out of 14, seven were killed that day. I think only two weren't even injured um, physically because mentally they're, they will never be the same. Um, and uh, their wives were the ones who... Um, passed on the information that the terrorists were wearing IDF uniforms and that they're speaking Hebrew and that if they're calling you to come out of your house with your hands up uh, because it's the it's the military, then not to go outside. It's a trap. 
they lure people out of the house and then they shot them or they kidnapped them or um so when she said when one of the women from the kibbutz said that i i still didn't realize that this was happening in our kibbutz um i asked her do we do we suspect that there are terrorists in the area or do we know that they're in the kibbutz she said we know um so again i thought okay a few they're probably here because i hear them shooting but then the WhatsApp groups for the kibbutz started blowing up and people were saying, we hear them outside our window and in a completely different part of the kibbutz. Um, they're inside our house. Um, um, I got a call from my daughter who said that she was um, there in our house, that she was shot. Um, someone um, sent a message that they're burning their house, uh, that they smell smoke and just more the, these messages were more became more and more frequent and then people started realizing that this is something insane was happening and it's not one or two they're not in this in our neighborhood right now they are in our neighborhood but they're also in the other side of the kibbutz and also on that side of the kibbutz and also in my parents neighborhood which on the it's on the other side of the kibbutz and on the southern western side right next to the fence my parents' house is right on the fence, right next to this junction of roads that, um, and next to a gate in the fence that really leads to all different parts of the kibbutz. And from their roof, you can really see everything. Um, so <laughs> we were just waiting, sitting there and waiting. I was um, keeping myself busy with taking care of our daughter and uh, making sure that she eats that she has a clean diaper and that she's not doing something stupid that could you know not taking a frying pan and putting it on her head or something like that um and my husband was standing holding the door handle and um keeping in touch with the um, whatsapp group for the kibbutz there was this whatsapp group a second hand group for the entire kibbutz and it became like the virtual the virtual war room. Um, and people added soldiers that were um that came to the kibbutz to try and rescue and fight. And um they added them to the group so they can know where to go. Um because there are no street names and then if you don't know the kibbutz, you don't know where you're going. You can't people say they live in that place, but their house is over there. But if you're not from the kibbutz, you really don't know how to get to that house. And maybe the door is like on the other side and there are all these houses that are divided and they have different entrances. So it's very hard to find people in their houses, um, which is why the fighting in Kfalaz, I think, took so long. I think it took them four days to clear the kibbutz completely of terrorists, four or five days. Um, and I think they got to my parents' house last. Um, they couldn't get to their house because... Um, the terrorists had used that house to um, to fight from it because it's a very well-placed house, strategically speaking. Um, so they kind of took over the house and, and used it for fighting. And then the IDF, once they cleared the terrorists out of the house, used the house for fighting as well. So it took a lot of time to get information um, on what happened to my parents. But at around 5 p.m., um, on Saturday, I lost contact with my parents. Um, they, um, my dad sent me a photo of my mom and uh, their dog in the safe room uh, at around 10 to five, something like that. Um, said they're resting. Um, as I said, they just moved back to their house so they didn't really have anything. They barely had any furniture and everything was still in boxes. So the safe room was, um, um, it was empty. There was a desk and a um, computer chair and the crib uh, for my daughter. We were there for dinner, for Friday dinner the day before, and um, we arrived really late. And we thought maybe our baby would be tired and maybe she'll want to sleep. And um, I asked my mom to open the crib saying, if she wants to sleep, we'll leave her there and then we'll come and pick her up in the morning. We're a two minute walk from them. Um, we're walking really slowly. 
and um she was not at all in the mood to sleep so we took her home it's a good thing we did um i think 10 minutes after my dad sent me the message the picture of them um my husband uh looked at me and asked um if i've spoken to my parents uh, recently, I said that I talked to my dad 10 minutes ago and I talked to my mom 15 minutes ago. They're fine. Why? Um, he, he said, text them again, call them again, see that they're okay. I sent my mom a message and as is everything okay? And she said um, she was online. She didn't respond. She received the message, but she didn't see it. And then she went offline. That was at five... Um, 502, 503, something like that. And um, and then I sent my dad a message. He wasn't, he was offline, but the message was received. And then I kept sending the messages. And I think the next two messages I sent my dad weren't received. My mom received them, but I didn't keep sending them any more messages um, because I knew that if, if, they were able to respond. They would see these messages and they would respond. Like there's no reason to keep, it's not like their phone is, they're not near their phone and they don't hear their phone. They're, we were all sitting like this. Every single person in Israel, I think, was sitting like this. So I knew that they, if they had their phone with them, they would see the message. If they are able to send me a message, they would. So I said, maybe they lost power because we had a power shortage an hour before. And I know that a lot of parts of the kibbutz, many neighborhoods didn't have power at all uh, since the morning. So um, there was no cellular communication at all. Um, the antenna fell or was sabotaged or something. And um, there was only Wi-Fi communication. So those who didn't have any electricity didn't have any way to communicate with anyone. And there were many, many people in the kibbutz that people assumed the worst. And all of a sudden, they saw them when they were being evacuated or the day after. And uh, so I didn't want to assume the worst. And uh, at around 10.30 p.m., our baby started crying. She couldn't sleep um, and she didn't want to eat and she didn't want her, her her pacifier and she didn't want anything. And I was holding her and she was squirming and she just couldn't relax. And, and she was wailing and crying. And the shooting that was, it was constant. It was all day. There was the soundtrack of, of, of automatic weapons and, and explosions and grenades and RPG missiles. And it was all day, um, all the time. At that point, the shooting started feeling closer. And um, at one point I heard the bullets pinging off the metal parts of the safe room. Um, I don't know if you know what a safe room is, by the way, it's not a panic room. It's not a shelter. It's not a bomb shelter. It's it's a fortified room that's supposed to protect you from rockets and from um, chemical weapons. And it's built to be able to be open from the outside, uh, to be able to rescue people inside who are injured or passed out or something. Um, so there are metal, um, the window is metal, and there are all these different metal parts outside. So I heard them, the bullets, um, hitting those uh, metallic parts and at that point I started to completely losing it I I was holding my baby she's crying I, I I feel like the bullet is about to go through the bullets are about to go through the walls and and what am I going to do I can't really bend down the room is so small and the bed is pretty much taking the entire space there's no space under the bed at all um, there's barely any room and space on the sides um, of the room where there isn't a bed. Um, we used it like half a storage. We didn't have anywhere to put our stuff. And um, and then we heard someone breaking the door, um, the front door, and walking inside our house and coming to the safe room and, and saying that it's the IDF. They were knocking and saying it's the IDF. Um, 
my husband was talking to them through the door, trying to get them to say longer sentences to hear their accent. And when he judged that their accent was truly Israeli, he opened the door and it really was um, the IDF. And um, we kind of ran out of half ran out of the room, uh, put shoes on. Um, we were like ready to be evacuated since about 530 when one of my friends sent me a message that she was rescued. Uh, she and her boys were rescued and they're out of the kibbutz. And um, they told us to grab a few things, like whatever we can in a minute and and just out, we're taking you to another apartment. I thought they were going to take us out of the kibbutz, but then they led us to another apartment um, in our neighborhood. And um, we saw a lot of our neighbors and we saw that none of our houses were really damaged. Um, there was a lot of mess outside, but mostly like people went inside and just threw stuff outside. And um, since our house is very old, we know that the only time that people went into our house because we could hear it was when the soldiers came into our house. So there was mess that was caused by them searching the house. Um so we were optimistic. We saw all of our friends. We saw that there was no real damage done um, to our houses. And um, someone said over there, uh, we haven't heard from Veronica in hours since 10 this morning. And someone else said, oh, no, I saw her. She's fine. And then everyone was like, oh, OK. So I thought, OK, so I haven't heard from my parents in five hours at this point, but it maybe it's fine. They haven't heard from her since the morning and now they've seen her and she's fine. So we were waiting there. Um, I think we were 16 people and six dogs, um, not including the baby that was on me. Um, and um, we were there for a couple of hours and then they um, brought us outside so uh, they could brief us on how we were going to leave. Um they said, we're going to evacuate you under fire. Um, we're going to create a circle around you. You're going to walk on this road and nowhere else. Don't get off to go to the grass. Don't get off to go anywhere else. Only on the road, only inside the circle of soldiers. Um, we're going to take you to the gas station right outside the kibbutz and um, going to get you on buses and they're going to drive you somewhere safe. And... Um, as he was saying this, uh, the shooting resumed and they and then he did like this and we all dropped everything we were holding and went back to the to the apartments we just left. Um, we were there for another hour or two. Um, some rooms had air conditioning, some didn't. Um, there was a girl who was very heavily pregnant um, who was... Um, they were scared going into early labor. Um, she, she, they managed to calm her down to get her to a hospital and she was fine. She had the baby since then. Um, uh, at around, I think, 1 or one thirty in the morning. Uh, this is already Sunday morning. Uh, we were um, evacuated. We started walking out. And as we were walking through the kibbutz, you could see the, I only looked towards the parking lot to where the fence of the kibbutz was and where the cars were parked along the fence. And I wasn't looking to the other side where you can see the houses and the whole kibbutz. Um, and uh, you can see the cars getting flatter and flatter and like tanks rolled over them and cars on top of cars and just cars that were completely destroyed, like you could you saw a door somewhere four cars down and I was looking at it and I couldn't believe my eyes that this is what I'm seeing and um what would have taken 10 minutes on a normal day took us I think an hour to walk and as we were leaving we got to the gate of the kibbutz and I looked to the right um to the road that leads to my parents house and I saw a dead body thrown somewhere up the road my husband saw that I saw it and he said it's a terrorist and they said I, I have no way of refuting this so I'll believe you 
we walked outside and there were buses waiting for us. There were soldiers, there were police, there was a ton of people outside of the kibbutz and um, they got us on a bus and we were evacuated um, to Shfaim, the kibbutz Shfaim. It's in the center of Israel near uh, Herzliya and uh, where we've been ever since uh, for the last almost six months. And on Wednesday evening, after we went to the police to give, um, to open a missing person report, a missing person file, and I gave DNA. So in case my parents weren't recognizable or they were in a hospital and they didn't have any identification so that they can be identified. Um, and um, there was no information, there was nothing. And now that I think of it, I think those four days were probably the longest days of my life. Like every phone call, I I I usually don't pick up to numbers I don't know, but like every single phone call, I immediately pick up no matter what I was doing, if I was mid-sentence. Um, and every phone conversation started with, I have no news to give you. Not good, not bad. We just have more questions and we need more information. And uh, Wednesday evening, um, a member of the kibbutz who was a friend of my dad, she was a very, very high up officer. She had a very um, important role in the military. And um, she stayed for three days in the kibbutz to help the soldiers move around the kibbutz and to rescue people and to identify uh, bodies. And she came to Shfaim on Tuesday and on Wednesday I begged her basically to tell me what's happening, to give me any kind of information because I can't continue without knowing anything. Like even the state of the house, like you were there, you were physically just there, like tell me what's happening. And she came to our room. She said that she went to their house on Tuesday. And um, when she was there, the there were no, they weren't there anymore. She said that um, she knows that there were two bodies that were taken out of the safe room uh, the day before. And she um, contacted the officer who was there. Um, she gave him a description of my parents uh, before and he identified them according to the description that she gave them. Um, he called back while she was sitting uh, with me and my sister and um, he basically said that, um, yes, we went in the house. We managed to get control of the house. We went in the safe room and there were two dead bodies. Um, all evidence show that it was immediate and um, instantaneous. Um, they didn't suffer um, a prolonged death because no one can take away the hours of panic and terror that preceded that. Um, And the day after we got um, a visit from the um, from the um, IDF, from the uh, unit responsible for um, notifying families, and um, they notified about uh, my mom. And the Tuesday after that, they notified us about my dad. Um, we're still getting some of their possessions. I got my mom's glasses and bracelets a month ago. Um, we got her wedding rings three months ago. Um, every time they, they identify something, they find something else, they contact us and they give it to us. So we thought we were done and then they brought us their glasses. Um, And that's um, basically it. This is a very hard week for me because it's Purim. And um, it's the first Purim that um, our daughter is really, you know, and the Purim, um, after she was born, she was, um, how old was she? She was six months. Um, we didn't really dress her up in anything. We didn't really... Um, 
think about getting her a costume or anything. We said, we'll do it next year. We'll do it next year. And um, you know, we dressed her up and she's so cute. <laughs> and uh, I keep thinking of how much I want to send my mom and dad a picture of her. And my mom's hamantaschen were just the best hamantaschen in the world. She was the best baker. She, there was nothing she couldn't bake. And um, she would make the filling out of poppy seeds. And it's like really hated here in Israel, poppy seeds. And I'm like one of the only few people who like it, except my mom and my other sisters. Um, and so I keep asking people to get me poppy seed hamantaschens. And they're like, oh, I'll get you a box. And they give me a box of hamantaschen. And it's just, it doesn't taste the same. <laughs> And um... Aaron, thank you so much. I know how how hard this is. I I don't know actually. I don't I don't want to say that I know because I, I don't know. I don't know how hard this is for you. And I I want to thank you and for 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 sharing that with with our with our community here in Baltimore, the Baltimore Zionist District, and and beyond because I. I can tell you I, I how how important it is for for you to to share a testimony like this um because as you know there are people out there that don't believe that this happened and all the horrible things that we see on social media about Israel and the Jewish people and it's 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 really incredible that you you can share this and you can sit here and and tell all of us and I hope that from you doing what you're doing it gives everybody on this call over 250 people and beyond strength to to stand in unity and to share what you have shared with us with with everybody that they know and I I want to thank you deeply from me personally and from our organization for for being here and and for sharing that with us and i know that everybody on the call um thanks you and takes um gives deep condolences for for everything that you went through and that and that you're going through and we truly truly appreciate you and your family and and your daughter for for everything that you are going through and we hope that you accept the the condolences and everything that you have been through. And personally, I was in Kfaraza in December and have seen um, what what had happened there. And I do encourage everybody on the call if you have the opportunity to go and to bear witness to what to what happened in in Israel on October seventh. I I do. People ask me all the time. I do encourage you to go and and to see it in person what what um Karen and her family um and and other Israelis had lived through um on on that Black Friday as as Mirit said. I, I think there's nothing more important than to bear witness to to that day so that you can come back to the United States and talk about that and and share it with your communities as we do and as as Karen just did. Karen, thank you so much. Um thank you. That's all I think. Thank you. It's what what you're doing is is I think the most important. Like you said, the reactions that we're seeing, I mean, the world has lost it completely. Um, just unreal. Like I can't believe this is the reality that we're living in, and it's just ridiculous. Uh, we need to stand together. What you're doing is the bearing witness, keeping it alive I was just talking to someone today um her daughter was um she's a nova survivor um and so we we were looking at the news and there was this item about i don't know what and we're just looking at each other and we're both thinking the same thing like that's it we've moved on and they've forgotten us yeah. our own yeah. country <laughs> this happens yeah. this is still happening there are still hostages <laughs> There are Absolutely. still five hostages from Faraza. There are still 134 hostages in total. And they're just, you know, one of them celebrated her 31st birthday yesterday. 
Um, we have definitely it. not forgotten. We have a Nova survivor coming here on the 26th to speak to our teen community and our Hillel community and our adult community. So we we are definitely not forgotten. Nobody on this call either. So we are with you. We are united. And yes. thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I want to introduce Sharon and thank you, Sharon, 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 I've read it in English, Sharon, thank you for waiting. And I know that you have daughters that are waiting, that are waiting for you. So thank you for waiting for, for waiting for us. Um, Sharon Aloni Cunho, who along with her two twin daughters, Emma and Yuli, almost four years old, was released from captivity by Hamas after 52 days. Uh, Sharon's husband and brother-in-law are still captive, uh, are still captives of Hamas. Sharon, we are very grateful that you are here and able to speak to us today um, and, and give your testimony. Sharon, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me here. Um, so, like you heard, my name is uh, Sharon Aloni Cunho. I've been together with my husband, David, for the past almost 11 years. He was born and raised in Kibbutz Ni Oz, right outside of the Gaza border, two kilometers away. Um, we've been married for six years. Our last anniversary, I don't want to say uh, celebrate it, but we mentioned it together during our captivity in November, November 1st. And we've decided to build our house and our lives in our little piece of heaven called Niroz without even imagining the most horrifying scenario that could happen, that did happen. So I'll uh, tell you a bit about what happened. Um, on October 6th, we had a Simchat Torah weekend. I invited my older sister, Danielle, and my nephew, Amelia, to come and stay with us. We went to my mother, to my in-laws in, uh, and having this amazing dinner. We were 20 of us. And after we went back to our house, we gave our bedroom to my sister and my nephew. I slept on a mattress with my girls in the safe room and David slept on the couch in the living room. Around 6.30 a.m., he ran into the Mamad, that's how it's called, and told me there were red alerts going on and off. And I told him, go and wake up Danielle and Amelia and call them immediately inside. He called them. We're all inside without really understanding what is happening because we understood immediately that it was something different. We never had that amount of missiles in such a short time. Around 7, 10 a.m., we were informed there are terrorists in the kibbutz dressed up as IDF soldiers. I want to mention that we were, I think, the only kibbutz that the army did not arrive to. Um, they have arrived after around 3 p.m., after all the terrorists and all the people from Gaza has already left. So around 7.15, they told us to hold the doors, which, like you heard before from Karen, was not built in order to prevent people from getting in. And then we thought... It's a possibility of two or three terrorists and the first response unit of the kibbutz will go after them. There is about eight or nine people of those. Um, not a lot, not a while after we started, we have um, a WhatsApp of all the moms in the kibbutz. Each one started saying they're at my place, they're at my place. And you can see different areas in the kibbutz and you start to understand that something else is going on. It's not one or two terrorists. 
um, after after I was released, I learned there were a few hundreds only in Oz. We had no we had no chance. We were conquered. And then people starting started saying that they're setting their houses on fire. People were murdered. They, you can hear screamings. Do not open the door to anyone. I think at around 10, our neighbors wrote that they're inside their house. And we knew it was a matter of time, of minutes, until the breaking to our house as well. My husband, David, held the door for around five hours. At that point, I texted to my family in Yavne, which was terrified, my parents and my brother that they are in our neighbor's house and we're probably not gonna make it. After a few minutes, they broke into our house. They went, you can hear them screaming in Arabic, Allah uh, Akbar. They came, they, you can hear, you can hear all the mess that they did inside the house. They took a lot of our belonging, belonging, belongings, sorry. And then uh, afterwards, they came into the safe room and started pounding on the door and screaming in Arabic, if the khilbab, which means open the door. David fought with them on the door. They cut off the, uh, our electricity. So we had no light, no air, nothing. The door has begun, has begun to open a bit, the handle. And David yelled, Sharon, please help me. They're opening it. So I closed it. I jumped and I closed it with him. And we fought with them on the door for several minutes. We were all sweating and tired and frightened. And after a few minutes, they just gave up. And then you can start hearing the voices of something letting up. They set our house on fire. Smoke started entering our safe room. And that's when my sister told me, send a goodbye message to our parents because we're not going to make it. There is um, a known voice message of mine saying, they're burning the house down. We're not going to make it. I'm sorry. I love you. And that was our last contact with my parents. After a lot of smoke started coming inside, I told David we have to climb out the window. And he begged me not to do that because there's a lot of terrorists outside and we will be shot. I told him what's the other option to stay here and suffocate to death. We have three little girls. My twins were three, three years old and three months and Amelia was five and a half. I opened the window and I, the first thing I see is three of our cars, my sister's, mine, and my husband's, burning up like torches. We started thinking, what the hell is going on in the kibbutz? In the meanwhile, they set uh, on fire to my brother-in-law, David's twin house as well. All during our captivity, we had no idea if he's alive, if his family is alive. David, which is still in captivity, has no idea that his brother is alive after he thought he was dead. And David climbed out the window. I handed him Yuli. And at that moment, when he came back to take Emma, I saw three terrorists coming directly at their direction. I told him, grab the girl and run away. And I closed the window. Afterwards, um, Later on, he told me he was captured in our neighbor's house with a knife by a terrorist. And at that point, they took him um, towards the fields, which was uh, like a cart or something waiting. They uploaded a few of the a few members of the kibbutz. I tried to open the window again. There was a terrorist outside waiting with an automatic weapon, a Kalashnikov, and he was aiming at me. I screamed at my sister, Danielle, close the window. And she, 
right when he shot two shots, we closed the window and he wasn't able to, to hit us. At that point, I think I accepted the fact that we were about to die from suffocation. Um, I was with the, um, on my last, in the last minutes before a kidnapping, I lost, I passed out. And at that point, Danielle, my sister, woke me up and told me, open the window, let them shoot us. It will be quicker and less painful than to suffocate to death. We heard our girls. We only stayed with Emma and Amelia. Amelia was screaming, I can't breathe. Emma was suffocating. She couldn't even breathe. She kept on coughing. And there were five or six of them already pounding on the window. And we decided to open the window and just let them shoot us. And at that point, we opened the window, waited to be shot, and they didn't shoot us. They took me out first. I collapsed on the ground. They took out Emma, then Amelia, and then Danielle. I told Danielle, grab, grab Emma. I was, I was unable. I was half, half conscious. And at that moment, one of them decided to drag me alone. And I was sure he was about to rape me and murder me. He dragged me by my knees. At some point, I managed to get up on both of my legs. And he dragged me, fortunately, towards the same tractor David was captured on. He saw the guy leading me and he started screaming at him, this is my wife, bring her here. So they motioned him to bring me there. And from that minute, thank God, I was with my husband and only one of my, of my daughters. They, after our release, Danielle told me they took them by another vehicle and right when they moved the border to Gaza, when they entered Gaza, some guy with a weapon just took Emma from her hands and she started screaming at him. And he told her, he motioned her with the gun to sit down. And she had to, because she didn't want to be shot in front of her own daughter. At that point, Emma, my girl was alone for 10 days. Probably as far as we know, with an Arab family, with no one who understood her. They gave her an Arab name. No one knew where she is. I kept asking them about Emma. I, my girls are identical. I, I told them she looks like this one, please find her. And they kept on telling me she's in Tel Aviv. Don't worry, she's in Tel Aviv. I knew she wasn't. I saw the people who took us out of the window. I understood how evil they were. And then after nine days, they moved us to another location. And the next day they decided to film us. And at that point, when they started filming us, they told me to put on the hijab and told the V to hold Yuli. And at that point, I started hearing crying outside the door. And I told David, I grabbed him. I told him, this is Emma's crying. This is Emma's sound. And he told me, you're losing your mind. It's not Emma. How come she will be here? And the crying gets louder. And a man enters to the room and handing me Emma like she's a package, all screaming and hysterical after 10 days by yourself. It, it felt like giving an, a, giving birth again, that what it was. After that, we were reunited. And after a while, they kept on adding people, another members of Niroz to our room, 12, 12 square feet, 
room. It's not a big room. They gave us um, moldy pitas, a little bit of cheese, um, very spicy rice. A lot of the times I had to explain to the girls when they told me they're hungry that I have nothing to give them. I'm sorry. Sometimes even I yell, I've yelled, but I have nothing to give you. We had no idea if for the next day they're going to give us new pitas. So we have to think today we're only going to eat a quarter of pita because we need to save up for tomorrow morning. Very it's things that really reminds of the Holocaust. And it's terrifying to say that because I can't even imagine what they've been through in the Holocaust, but I can know what it's like to, to see one pita and tell myself I have to eat only a quarter because I have to save up for my girls. We were not allowed to go outside of the room. We had to knock in order to go out to the bathroom or to get water or anything else basic. And my girls, which was already without diapers, had to pee in the sink and poop in the trash. Because when you knock on the door, you will never know if it takes them two minutes to open the door or two hours. It was really difficult when we were sick. We all had diarrhea. We're all vomiting and it's, you had to do it in the sink and very unsanitary. I don't even have to explain you that. And on the night before the ceasefire, the, the first ceasefire began, they entered the room and they told us that there is a ceasefire. It was a, which is about to take place. And it's only women and children. And at that point, they explained us that they're taking the vid to a different place. We sat for three hours on the floor, hugging each other, while me and the girls are begging him not to go. I even told him, I want to stay with you. Our families will take care of the girls. They will take him out of Gaza. I will stay here with you. It was not an option. They took him down to the tunnels. And since then, I have no information about him. It's been over 110 days since I last saw or heard of him. He is the love of my life. He's the best father that anyone can ask for. And it's not even a part of the hopefully upcoming deal because he's a man and they consider him as a soldier because he's only 33 years old and he's missing out a lot. And the girls keeps asking about him. And it's tough. I have to tell them all the time that there is no other place daddy wants to be in. And I have to tell them that I really hope he comes back. And when I go to my interviews and I have the shirt with his picture on it, they ask me, why do you wear that? I tell them because I'm going to talk to people in order to bring daddy home. And I can't even promise them that because I have no idea if I'm, go if I'm ever going to see him again. That's our horrifying story. After 52 days of captivity, I was released with my twin daughters, without my husband, without my brother-in-law, who is also there with his girlfriend, and her brother, who had a baby nine days after he was kidnapped. And I beg all of you, please talk to anyone you can talk to anyone you can. A lot of people don't even know that there are hostages in Gaza. They don't even know that they're just talking about all the other things concerning the war and not about the hostages. That's it. Sean, thank you. 
thank you so much for for sharing your story with us and your thank you for for sharing with us and um is there anything that you would that you recommend that that people here in the United States do that that you have done or that you've seen people do speak to our Congress people send letters anything that you could recommend for us to do potentially that would be helpful to you or to your family everything just speak out our story speak out all the hostages story they're not just names I have cousins living in New York they're saying that their picture is being torn down when they put it up and they just tore it down and my cousin tells me I can't, I can't put it anymore. Every time I put a new one, they tear it down. They think we're the bad guys. We were only people in our houses who were kidnapped barefoot with our pajamas. We had nothing to do with it. In Kibbutz Niroz alone, one out of four was murdered or kidnapped. We were the most amount of kidnapped people in Gaza. There were, I think, 240 people. 80 of them is for mules. So please talk to Biden, talk to the Congress, talk to anyone who's an influencer. And please help me bring my husband back. I deserve him and my girls deserve their father back. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we do the best we can with this organization and we promise to uphold our promise to you and we stand united with you and your family and, and the people of Israel and the women of Israel. Thank you so much for sharing so much. everything you so that, for that listening. you do and for, for being so brave and, and sharing everything with us. We truly do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you too. We appreciate you. Thank you. I do. Thank you. Thank you all so much for, for being with us, but a big, mostly a big thank you to, to our three speakers today for, for coming out and for, for, for giving their testimony. And I, I do hope that you will share what you heard today and that you will be their voices moving forward. We will send a recording of, of this Zoom and we hope that you will share it, but not only the recording, but also share your voices because that really is what matters. The testimonies can only go so far because they can only speak so much, but we can speak on their behalf and we do every single day. And we hope that you will do the same thing. Thank you so much for being with us today on this Tuesday. We know that it was hard and we know that it was emotional, but it couldn't be any more emotional for the spe three speakers that we hear today. We appreciate you being here. We appreciate you listening as always. We will see you next Tuesday and we will send out the recording later this afternoon. Thank you to Maccabi World Union's Women's Division for putting this together and for partnering with us on this very special event. Um, together we will win. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.